If we didn't know better, we might at this point in the Gospel of Mark be tempted to think that the wheels are starting to come off Jesus' ministry. Yeah, some good things have happened, but there's a lot of adversity. And if you haven't read it before, you might wonder whether it can be navigated successfully. Jesus has done some miracles. He's done some healings. And that's awesome and great and good. People are being cared for. Ministry is happening. But there's a lot of opposition, isn't there? These Pharisees pop up out of nowhere all the time and challenge Jesus and threaten Him. The disciples spend so much time with Jesus and have no idea what's going on. They're constantly confused, constantly frustrated, constantly trying to figure out and navigate and manipulate the situation and, and, and discover what they're supposed to be doing, but they can't get it right. And Jesus seems to experience some frustration with them. Do you still not understand? He asks. And then they get off the boat. And all of a sudden, as Jesus goes to heal a blind man, which He's done successfully before, it takes not one attempt, but two. What's going on? Now, most of us are familiar with the story. We've read it before. And we know that the Gospel of Mark is racing its way towards the resurrection of Jesus. We've read the story, so we know that things aren't going off the rails. The ministry's not falling apart. But that raises questions for us, doesn't it? If everything is going along and it is moving to this climactic resolution, why the struggles? Why the adversity? Why doesn't Jesus heal this blind man fully the first time? Mark wants us to ask questions like that. And as we begin to consider the answers that emerge out of the text we're reading today, it may be helpful to pause and reflect on our own experience. Perhaps you remember a time when you had something that had to be done, but you couldn't quite figure out what the steps were. Something needed to happen. You knew where it needed to go, but the process was fuzzy, unclear. So what do you do? You seek a mentor. Maybe you go to your small group. Here's this thing. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's something else. Will you pray for me? You seek wise counsel. You pray about it. And over time... You have a sense that the Lord is at work, the Spirit is present, and things that were fuzzy become clear. The gift of His grace and life in the community. Taking that sort of experience and considering the text we have before us today, we're in a position to ask, what if Jesus takes a little more time to heal this blind man at Bethsaida? Not because he's not able to do it the first time, but because he wants the disciples in the first century and us disciples in the 21st century to see more clearly that the work Jesus does in us is a work in progress. That sanctification, while we can have moments of great growth, still is a process that takes the whole of our lives. There is always further work for Him to do. There's always a next step. And if Mark wants us to see that Jesus is focused on the process and the next step, 
then he also wants us to consider how important that next step is. Mark might put it this way for us. The most important thing Jesus needs to do is the next thing he wants to do. And of all the things that have happened in the past or all the things that could happen in the future, the most important thing is the next thing. After all, you can't get to the things he wants to do in two months without going through the things he'd like to do this afternoon, can you? So what's important? What's important is what Jesus wants to do now. The disciples haven't quite figured all that out yet. But the Lord is patient and he wants to lead them into an experience of discovering the ways that he patiently works within them. Now, this revelation of the process that the Lord is at work doing comes in the context of some other signs and wonders. And the, these signs and wonders help reveal the nature of the work Jesus wants to do. So Jesus is in Gentile territory. He's outside of Judea, outside of the Holy Land, in the vicinity of Tyre, Sidon, and into the region of the Decapolis. That's Gentile territory. Even there, people flock to him. So he's not even around his hometown. He's somewhere else, and his reputation is so broad, so wide, that people flock to him, and they bring people who need to be healed, people who need to be touched. And so, in verse 32, some people bring to Jesus a man who was deaf, he couldn't hear, and could hardly talk. Perhaps he has some sort of speech impediment, whatever it is, no intelligible words are coming out of his mouth. Maybe he tries and struggles and experiences the frustration of being enable, unable to communicate effectively. And so the people bring him to Jesus. What else are they going to do? And this is one of those places where, where the Bible just feels weird. Sometimes we can read it and go, yeah, that really resonates with my experience. Other times we read it and go, I'm not sure what's going on here. And this is one of the, the latter times. Try to imagine what it would be like if somebody came into the room and we found out they had a reputation as a healer and they went up to one of us and sort of stood you up and stuck their fingers in your ears, spit in your face, and started shouting in a language you don't understand. Ephatha! We might take a step back. <laughs> we might call the security team. We would certainly take some caution. That feels foreign. In the first century, though, Jesus' behavior falls right in line with what you might expect from a healer. If someone's doing a certain kind of behavior, or if someone lives into a certain kind of identity, you expect a certain kind of behavior. After all, when you visit the doctor's office, what do they do? Well, first you sign in, then you go to that first room and you get your weight and your blood pressure and your height, all those kinds of things. Then you go into that other room and Somebody comes in with a stethoscope and they listen to you breathe. And if any of those pieces get skipped, you probably wouldn't have much confidence. You'd, pre you'd be looking for another physician, wouldn't you? But Jesus is doing the sorts of things that healers in the first century would do. He's apparently a lot better at it, and that's why people flock to him. But he's still running in some of the same habits and practices. And he does that because the rhythms create a sense of confidence. This guy can do what we believe he can do, what we expect him to do, what he's already done he can do again. And he does here. Even if it feels strange to us, with the languages and the spittle, he heals the man. All of a sudden, the man can hear and he can speak plainly. Jesus moves on. We're growing accustomed to the rapidity of Mark's narrative, aren't we? And we hear about 
Jesus several days later, apparently at least three days later, because that's how long he's been teaching. <laughs> you think this sermon's going to be long, just three days, that's a long sermon. Jesus is teaching and everybody's hungry. They've been out there for a long time. Their supplies are exhausted and he has compassion on them. He wants to feed them. We've heard this story before, haven't we? Or something like it. The disciples apparently have a short memory though. Because Jesus expressing compassion, which if you'll remember when he fed the 5,000, it was because he had compassion. But Mark wants us to connect the dots here. He's got a crowd. They're hungry. He has compassion. What do you expect him to do? Feed them. And yet the disciples answer, where in this remote place can anyone get enough food to feed this many people? You would think they would remember just a few chapters ago when Jesus took five loaves and a couple of fish and fed at least 5,000. Apparently they don't. And so Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? Their sensibilities don't appear to extend to the degree that they remember what he's all about and what he's able to do. And so they answer, we've got seven. So they sit the crowd down. He gives thanks, begins distributing the food. 4,000 people are fed. And there's seven baskets left over. Even all of that is unexpected from the disciples. You might wonder who's really the blind one in the story from the way things are going. Mark says, next scene. Pharisees show up and they ask for a sign from heaven. And the reader's thinking, <laughs> haven't they been paying attention? I mean... 4,000 people get fed with seven loaves. Deaf mute is healed. Before that, 5,000 people got healed. Walking on water, calming storms, like all the stuff. Signs all over the place. Where Are they even paying attention? And Jesus embraces the moment to sort of rebuke them, doesn't he? Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. He recognizes the signs are all over the place, and they're asking for a sign, not because they want to honor Him, not because they want to hear from God, but because their hearts are hardened against Him. Now Jesus is in the boat with the disciples. Scene changes. And this is the place where Mark begins to connect the dots for us between blind people being healed and disciples who can't see the one that's standing in front of them. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread in the boat. They had one loaf for 13 grown men, so it probably wouldn't go quite far enough. It feels like one of those things where maybe you've been on a car ride with somebody and you're thinking about something that happened maybe the day before and everybody else is having a conversation and all of a sudden you sort of say something out loud and no one else knows what you're talking about because you were having that inner monologue thing and they're thinking, what's he talking about? So Jesus is in the boat with the disciples and all of a sudden he says, be careful! Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and, the, and Herod. And the disciples are thinking, what do we miss? What's he talking about? We have a loaf of bread. What's all this about yeast? Maybe he's mad because we didn't bring any more bread. We had seven whole baskets and we didn't think to bring any of it. And he's frustrated. What are we going to do? And so Jesus perceives that they're not following. Like, by the way, this is one of those places in the Bible where there's evidence for the trustworthiness of these texts. Let's just say if we were the apostles and we were making up stories about ourselves, we'd probably make ourselves look a little bit better than these guys. If you're telling bad stories about yourself, chances are it's true. Because most people don't tell lies that paint themselves poorly. 
So the disciples are painted very badly here. They look bad. They don't get it. They, they're dim-witted. They're in the dark. They don't perceive what Jesus is up to, and that's precisely what he says. They discussed with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Why is he talking about yeast? And Jesus is aware of their discussion, and he asked them, why are you still talking about bread? Because that's not the point, is it? Why are you still talking about bread? Don't you see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And all of a sudden, we're remembering that just a few passages ago, we heard about a guy who had ears that didn't work very well. And Jesus restored him. And Mark wants us to see this connection that the physical healings point to Jesus' ability to heal spiritual handicaps. Now, this isn't a theme Mark made up off the start. It has Old Testament credentials. Consider the book of Isaiah. If you go back to the familiar narrative of Isaiah's vision of God in the temple and his calling, who will go for us? Isaiah, here I am, send me. And God's responding, I'm glad you've already volunteered without asking what we're sending you to do. Because <laughs> here's what you can expect. A hard-hearted people who won't see what you're doing or understand. You can expect people to listen but not perceive. To see but not perceive. It's in Isaiah 6. Here I am, send me. All right, go and tell this people, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Isaiah, you're going to go, but you're going to meet blind people with hard hearts who aren't interested in what you have to say. Later on, this spiritual disability is connected to idolatry. Isaiah says, here's, here's, here's what idolatry is like. You take a log and you cut it in half. One half, you build a fire and you cook your soup for supper. The other half, you carve an idol for yourself, one of your gods. Implication, what kind of god could it really be if the same log was used to cook your supper? And you'll carve out this God, and, and because you know what he's supposed to look like, you'll carve a little face, and it'll have ears and eyes, a nose, and a mouth. But it turns out with idols, <laughs> they have ears, but they can't hear your prayers. They have eyes, but they can't see your need. They've got mouths. You whittled it down but they can never speak words of comfort and forgiveness over your sin. And then Isaiah draws the connection between idolatry and formation, or maybe we should call it deformation, because people who worship false gods ultimately become like them. If you worship a God who has ears but can't hear, your spiritual sensitivity to hear God well is going to be muted. If you worship a false god who has eyes but can't see, your ability to see and perceive the work of God, Pharisees, will decline. If you worship blind gods, you'll become a blind person. However, in Isaiah, there's a promise. It comes in chapter 35. It's the day when the desert and the parched land will be glad. It's the day when the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. It's the day when God will rescue His people. Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come to save you. And this is what will happen, Isaiah says, when He comes to save you. The, then will the eyes of the blind be opened. 
and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. For Isaiah, physical handicap or disability is an analogy or an illustration for a spiritual malady, spiritual disability, a spiritual insensitivity. My spiritual senses to perceive God don't work. But when God acts to save, He'll restore all of that. And so Mark gives us Jesus, who is alluding to Isaiah all over the place. Do you have ears but don't hear? Inviting us to recognize that the day of the new renewal is being launched in Jesus. After all, the mute speak, the deaf hear, the lame leap like a deer. The day of the renewal that the prophet anticipated is happening in front of them. And Jesus warns them about the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod because like the idol worshipers of Isaiah's day, the Pharisees and the others see their God at work and do not recognize Him because their eyes are dim and their ears are closed. Jesus puts His finger on the place that needs to be healed. He touches the dark place in their heart, the dangerous place. The place that if it's left untended will grow increasingly oppositional to Him, just like the Pharisees who see the work of God and are blinded to His grace. Who see God in Christ present, doing things only God can do trampling on the sea and bringing bread from heaven. And they reject Him. That, Jesus says, is the yeast of the Pharisees. And it corresponds to spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness. And instead of using their mouths to bear witness to God's faithfulness, they use their mouths to publicly shame and attack Jesus. So they get off the boat, and here's a blind man. He has eyes, but he can't see. And the people bring him to Jesus. There's more spit, and Jesus puts his hand on the man's eyes and asks him, Do you see anything? And the man responds, well, I see people, but they look more like trees. And if you're nearsighted, you know what this, you know what he's talking about. Those of us, (laughs) those of us who are unable to see things at a distance understand that if I don't have glasses on, you're all just fuzzy stumps. So Jesus heals him partially, like things are better, but he's not done. And so what does the Lord do? He touches him again. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. He saw everything clearly. Quite the contrast with disciples in the boat who see nothing at all. The day of renewal has come. The question is, will the people around Jesus be surrendered to the renewing work that He desires to do? And will they recognize that His work of renewal is going to take more than an afternoon on a boat? Why? Because the problem is worse than we thought it was. Because the darkness that we enter into the world in is darker than we thought it was. Because our hearts are sicker than we thought they were. 
and because we're more resistant to his grace than we've ever imagined. But he's patient, isn't he? He's kind. He's long-suffering. And he's willing to take the time to touch us once and to do it again and again and again and again as long as it takes to restore our sight. As long as it takes to restore our sight. Christian transformation, sanctification, growth in holiness, a life that is less marked by sin and more marked by the love of God in Christ filling our hearts takes time. It's a process. And if it's a process, then it's always wise to ask, what's next, Jesus? What do you want to do next? What's the next step? What's the next place in my heart where I don't see clearly? What's the next thing in my life where I don't hear clearly, where I need you to touch me and restore me and make me whole. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe my kids are estranged. Maybe I'm holding something in my heart against someone. Maybe it's a secret sin that no one else knows about. The question for followers of Jesus is, what's next, Jesus? And that's the most important thing today. That's the most important thing. What does he desire to do now? Interesting question to put to Pharisees and disciples in the first century, isn't it? What's the next step for a Pharisee who's publicly attempting to shame Jesus so that other people don't consider him honorable and follow him? That's what's going on. Anytime you challenge someone publicly in the first century, you are intending to shame them publicly. The dominant value in the ancient world was honor. And if you, the more honor you had, the less shame you had. And the more shame you had, the less honor you had. Inversely proportionate. And they're trying to dishonor him publicly so that people stop coming to him. What's the next step for those guys? If the work of Christ to transform, sanctify, to save is a process, what's the next step in the process? Well, it looks pretty clear that it's repentance. They're mired in their sin, and the only thing for them to do right now is to repent of it to turn from their sin to Jesus. To stop what they're doing and yield themselves to Him. It's true for us. Sometimes the next step is the first step. If we're far from Christ. If we've not yet been taken up by Him. If we've not yet discovered what it means to trust Him. To turn from sin. To experience His life-giving love for the first time. Sometimes the next step is the first step. It is for these guys. But then you have disciples. They've been with Jesus for a while now. And He's done a lot of great stuff in their lives. Important stuff. He's called them, follow me. He's equipped them. He's taught them. He's commissioned them. He sent them out, and they've done the things He's taught them to do. They've healed people. They've proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. I think we'd call that a maturing disciple, wouldn't we? What's the next step for these guys? And right here in the boat, Jesus is peeling back the layers of their hard-heartedness. Yeah, they're active in ministry. 
But there's stuff down in their hearts that they don't even know about yet. And it's black. It's dark. It's sick. And it needs the light of His perfect love. It needs to be brought into the day. Their next step is going to involve yielding their self-interest. As the Gospel goes on, we're going to discover just how big of a deal this is for these guys. They're not just with Jesus because because He's transformed them yet. There's a level at which they're trying to ride His coattails to the top. A couple chapters, they're going to ask the question, hey Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, who gets to sit at your right hand and your left? They're not thinking about the cross. Jesus is. They're not. They're thinking about cabinet positions. Who gets to be number one and number two? Can we be the people that people have to come to and get through to see you? When you come in your kingdom, who will be at your right and your left? They think he's going to the top and they want to ride with him. That's self-interest. The next step for them is to deny themselves and yield to His purposes, not their manipulations. That's the next step. And at this point in the text, it's the most important thing. In a few chapters, there may be another next step, and when that happens, that'll be the most important thing. (laughs) Whatever He wants to do next is most important. And there are things that distract us from this, aren't there? Sometimes we look to pivotal moments in our past, in our testimony, and forget that Jesus wants to work today. Our conversion can function this way for us at times. Obviously, that's important, crucially important. But sometimes we can be so focused on what Jesus did back then that we're not paying close attention to what He wants to do now. I got saved when I was 8, or 10, or 12, or 21, or 98. Whatever. That's great. That's awesome. That's lovely. We want that to happen. (laughs) Jesus has to take hold of us. But it's entirely possible to slide into a, well, let's call it a rut. Where we assume the most important thing is already done. And that means we're not asking the question, what is the important thing He wants to do now? Today. That's really the question Methodists have always been concerned with. You go back to John Wesley himself. It's great. I'm glad to hear the Lord has been at work in your life. What's He want to do now? What's He called us to do now? Why has He raised us up? Why are we here? How is He at work? What's next? And how do we best offer ourselves for His service in that way? Those are the questions that have driven the people called Methodists since the movement was launched. Those are the questions that faithful Christians are asking ever since Jesus took two shots to heal a blind man. This is a process. Jesus doesn't take two attempts because He's unable to do it the first time. He does it because we need to see and the disciples needed to see the problem is worse than we thought. And the process will take longer than we anticipate. The journey of following Jesus is a lifelong journey. So the question for us becomes, what's he want to do today? What is the next step? What is that all-important thing 
that has to happen now to get to whatever's going to be important tomorrow and the next day and the next. What has to happen now to get to the important thing later? Let me suggest that it may have to do with perception and witness. After all, that's the direction the text points us. The problem that is addressed here is a dullness of spiritual sensibility. Just like the man who was blind and couldn't speak, the disciples are blind, and their words are not yet faithful. Perhaps Jesus wants to come to us and touch our ears, the ears of our hearts, so that we can hear His Word clearly. Perhaps He wants to come and touch the eyes of our soul so that we can see Him and perceive Him clearly. Maybe my prayer needs to be, Jesus, where are the places in my heart, in my life, in my church, in my community, where I'm not perceiving what You are doing? Where my eyes are dim and my hearing is dull? Help my perception of You. Help me to see and hear You. Give me ears to hear. We hear that in the text again and again. And as we grow in our ability by grace to perceive what He's doing, perhaps He also needs to put His hands on our lips, our tongues, and give us the ability to speak faithfully about it. To bear witness to the work that He's done in us and in our community, and in the world. That's what He wants to do. He wants to restore our ability to see Him, to hear Him. And He wants to restore our ability to bear witness to His perfect love. Perfect love revealed on a cross. with pierced hands and feet and side, with a bruised body and torn flesh, offered for us so that we could be forgiven, made whole, restored, redeemed, so that we can bear witness with our mouths to that perfect love. And when that happens, when that's the posture of our hearts, what's the next thing, Jesus? What's the next thing? Not, well, He's working on me and maybe we'll get to it in a couple of years. I've heard that. What do you want to do today, Jesus? At 11.52 a.m. on May 26, 2024. What do you want to do now? Open my eyes. Open my ears. Open my mouth. Take the self-interest and purge it. Fill my heart with love for you. For my neighbor for the nations. So that's the question Mark offers us as he links up these stories in the narrative. What are the blind spots? Where's the deafness? Where are we in the process? And what does Jesus want to do next? That's the most important thing. What does he want to do next? Pray with me. Jesus, your kindness abounds. Your patience is 
so remarkably extensive. We are easily short-sighted, near-sighted. We easily turn a deaf ear to the things that you desire to do. Our desire, O oh Lord, is to experience your touch, your hand of healing, of restoration, of wholeness, as long as it takes. And Lord, open our eyes to the things that you want to do now. Know that wholeness isn't something you're saving for years down the road, but you desire to work in your people now. Change us. To heal us. To restore us. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your people. Sharpen our senses by your grace. For faithfulness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to worship in song. You're invited to stand as able. And let's respond to the Lord together. <clears throat>